Welcome to The Rational Egoist. I'm your host, Michael Leibowitz. Our guest here today is Owen Christensen. He is a magician and an objectivist philosopher, which some people might think don't go together, but uh, he is living proof that they do. Owen, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Michael, for having me. Owen, how old are you? So I'm 21. Oh, wow. Okay. So when did you first become interested in magic and what drew you to it? So um, I was interested in magic when I was about 14, 15 years old. One of my friends showed me a very basic trick uh, and I was just completely astonished. I need I needed to know it was an, a sort of very, a very urgent uh, and necessary um, a discovery I needed to make to know how was this possible. I knew that that something must have happened, but I didn't know precisely what. And so that's what I tried to discover. So I bought a, a very basic pack of cards, went on YouTube, searched, and after some time, I just realized, well, I know some secrets. Why not learn more and more and more and more and more? And now we're here technically, um, magic-wise at least. What, what do you think about – I'm a big professional wrestling fan. Now, growing yeah. up, we never got to know the secrets behind wrestling. We never knew yeah. what was going on with their real lives. And they pretend that it was real. At least they call it keeping kayfabe. Yeah. But now they're, I mean, you know, you'll see the show and then they're on the internet talking and they're, you know, we know what's really going on. They, they admit it's fake. And I remember, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago or so, there was a TV show unveiling magic tricks and, and yeah. there was, they would expose what was really going on yeah. behind the scenes. What do you think about that? Do you think that it's better to have the mystery? I mean, mm -hmm. it's not like we didn't know wrestling was fake yeah. and it's not like we don't know magic's not magic, but is mm -hmm. it better when it's the, it, the mystery is still there? Yeah. So I would, I would answer in two, in two sections. The first one is um, obviously there, there is a need to sort of keep the secret because if you know how it's done, then the only, the only thing that you're watching as a magic performance is simply events and actions of someone on stage. But you, you know basically everything that's happening. So there's no magic. There's no illusion. There's nothing. So it's just someone walking on stage and doing things. And you're just like, okay, well, I know what he's done. So there isn't really the, the, the secret component is really what makes magic magic. Um, but on the other hand, I would uh, I would completely um, I would completely defend the idea that if someone believes, for example, that 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 if the magician is so convincing that someone believes, or that someone who who has a sort of mystical background thinks like, oh well, is this real uh, or not? Then you should then as a, then as a magician, I think that that it is honest to say no there is a means behind this i'm not i'm not claiming to anything supernatural things are what they are and it's precisely because things are what they are that i can sort of do what i'm doing in effect uh, because it, i think it would have uh, an immense psychological impact for example on a child who was raised for for example uh, in a in a more sort of um mystical environment let's say um who 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 believes in effect that that miracles can happen and if he sees a magician doing that then real fear can can be inspired from that specific uh event and i wouldn't want to and and, and i don't think any magician would want to uh to scar a a child for life if he stays in that in that specific uh, environment i used to uh, watch this this uh program i don't know if you if you've heard of it called pen and teller fool us um, yeah. And, you know, what the, the premise of the show is magicians go on and they put on an act and the, the Penn and Teller try to figure out yeah. what it is. Now, they don't come outright and, and say it. They'll give little hints that yeah. they know. But watching it, the, just the craft and the skill that Penn and Teller have, it, it, yeah. it used to amaze me that they would be able to say, OK, that was – that's you know reminiscent of some unheard of magician that I never knew of. He used to do that back in the forties and this and that. And the guy would say, "Yeah, you got me." So for people out there that don't understand the the necessary skill 
behind yeah. the art form of magic. Just can, can you just explain without giving away the, the secrets, just yeah, how, yeah. how difficult is it and how much effort does it take to become good at what you do? Well, the first thing I would say is um, the, the method should never be thought apart from the effect that is, that is being presented. So the, the sort of seemingly magical events that are happening are never sort of divorced from the, from the, from the means. The means and the end are, are completely tied together on this part, which means that depending on the, on the difficulty or the impossibility of the, of the, of the effect, goes a specific method so it can be a very simple for example a card that that turns that sort of changes into another into another card in the spectator's hands uh and so really depending on there there are multiple methods to achieve that specific effect that specific seemingly impossible moment but um the the method the means really depends on on which means you are using in terms of practice though um i will say that it takes several several years months like it it, it takes uh, very long to sort of master the craft just just for for my person like in my personal experience just to handle a deck of cards properly or being comfortable with holding a deck of cards very loosely for example which may seem like something that is completely that it, that that may be extremely simple or very sort of relaxed uh, is in fact very difficult because you are you are sort of holding fifty two individual um, little little cards and to be able to sort of to to be comfortable with not sort of making one fall over or to sort of hen handling them with precision and so on takes very uh, it takes a very long time uh but it's not impossible uh many magicians at, usually many ma magicians who who learn about magic usually in their in their sort of teens late teens uh get to get to get to sort of practice practice and practice um not to sort of uh take a take a a, a hit toward cards magicians but um but you but usually that the, the time that would have been spent with spending time with friends and so on is usually spent practicing um their different techniques and so on when when they're using sleight of hand or learning uh, other uh, other types of of methods to achieve different um effects and different performances there's a famous saying from francis bacon that in order to be I, i'm going to butcher the quote but it's to in order to be commanded nature or nature to be commanded must be obeyed right mm -hmm. in in other words in order to live successfully in reality you have to acknowledge and deal appropriately with the laws of reality how does that affect what you do or how does that relate to what you do well in this well in the same way that that any human being uh needs needs in a uh, uh, in effect to uh to to base his entire knowledge if he if he wants at least to to succeed if if su if succeeding if living if pursuing and pursuing values is his is his main goal then any human being needs to sort of um follow this or or, or at least needs needs or needs to make it at some point his um his um his objective to to sort of know uh, the facts of, of, of reality and using them uh, to it to to his advantage to sort of um, change his backgrounds to his to his to his to his needs to his values and so on and so on. Well, magic in effect is in is the same thing. If the magician does not know what cards can do, for example, if uh, if we stay on the uh, with the example of cards, if the magician doesn't know what cards are and what they can do then then there isn't really any starting point if he doesn't know the weight of a coin if he for for example a dollar coin that you that used to be in, uh, in circulation back in the day um the if if the magician doesn't know the the weight if he doesn't know the way his uh, his hand is and if you can see this if he has like gaps in his hand well if he's going to hide a coin there it's very difficult if he if he has this. So he has to take in, in consideration a, a huge amount of of facts and and data in effect. 
to be able to um, to be able to sort of to at least know what he can and cannot do, and then from what he can do, um, organize a, a, um, a method in order to uh, perform a uh, a magic performance. If he doesn't know nature, then he cannot command it in effect. And in and in a magic performance, it he's he's not metaphorically commanding na uh, nature. Uh, he he shows, or at least he projects the view of literally commanding nature by sort of uh, changing the card or whatever. He or, or he also has to understand right the the normal sensory, perceptual, and conceptual apparatus of the audience, right? How they're likely to understand the things with which he does. Yeah. If he makes a coin yeah. appear to float, for instance. He has to understand that the audience is not used to coins floating, that they that they yeah. know <laughs> that a coin can't float and also how to, in essence, play a trick on, on those things. So the knowledge base and the understanding of reality on the part of the, the magician, a good one anyways, it, it yeah. has to be at a very high level, right? Yes, precisely. Well, there, I will give you, for example, one 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 very um, another example of this. Um, in, um, in, let's say, yes. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, the, when you think, when you think about the, the fact that consciousness can, can only, can only hold so much, uh, which is in objectivism called the pro epistemology. Pro -epistemology yeah. Pro epistemology. Yeah. The, when you, when you think about a spectator, he can only, he can only take in so much. So if, for example, a performance is very simple meaning that it, that, it, that it has very few events that, for example, the magician um, asks the, the spectator to choose a card, he loses it in, uh, uh, in, in the deck of cards, and then he makes it re reappear somewhere. There's only three units. It's very simple for the spectator to hold that in, um, in context until, uh, until the sort of magical moment um, happens, or the seemingly magical moment happens. But if there are, I don't know how many, how many events throughout the performance, then if the magician doesn't take into, into consideration that the, that the spectator can hold only so much, then he's going to lose his spectator throughout the performance. And at, and at the end, he won't, he won't sort of understand. He'll be like, uh, okay, I get why I need to, uh, to sort of react because this seems impossible, but, and and there's just the, this sort of, this sort of complete saturation on the part of the spectator, which is why the best magicians are the ones that, after a um, a certain number of events, summarize or generalize or essentialize what has happened, which which allows them to sort to to be, to condense that entire that entire um, context of events into those for for example two three sentences, which allows them to keep that context for more and more uh, information to come in but a magician that doesn't take that into consideration re uh, will will be faced with spectators that are that are just going to be completely baffled not in the sense that they're going to be astonished but baffled that they're just going to be like well I, I didn't understand or it's a bit confusing or mm, I just don't get it so you mentioned objectivism yeah and you be you became interested in magic. You said at fourteen. When did you become interested in objectivism? Um, I will say when I was nineteen. When I was nineteen, I I I I read my first my first uh, Ayn Rand um, essay. Uh, and and for the past two and a half years, I've been uh, I've been thoroughly uh, studying objectivism. Um, what was the essay? Do you remember? Uh, it was the objectivist ethics. I remember reading reading it in one in one in one sitting, closing the book, putting it aside, and just looking in front of me and thinking, "Life will never be the same after this." <laughs> That's awesome. And, and and in effect, it never has been the same. Uh, <laughs> since That's then. great. That's great. It, it how does objectivism relate? to magic because there has to be a connection right there's there's no contradictions yeah. you want to be integrated so yeah. how do, how does how do they relate but how does objectivism help you as a magician yeah. and maybe and how does being a magician help you to appreciate objectivism 
Yeah, I maybe yeah. I maybe just violated the crow yeah. epistemology principle myself by asking yeah. too much. <laughs> but but you know, how do they relate? Let's just put it. Yeah, down. how do how do they relate? Yeah, yeah. So if you if you think about it, magic is an art form. Now I would I would defend and I have defended multiple times um, on and off um, camera that uh, it is an, an art form in the same respect as literature is an art form, as um, painting is an art form, and so on and so on. The, the reason for that is, is, that, is that magic projects through these seemingly impossible moments a specific view of man and of reality and their relationship to one another. For example, if you if you look at a at a magician who is in complete control of of the entities involved that that he that he that he correctly predicts um, x piece of information if he if he if he makes the coin successfully vanish and so on and so on then he then he presents himself as an achiever of the impossible and he shows that 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 man is is competent to deal with reality in this sort of very extreme and very effortless sense. On the other hand, if the if the magician uh, creates a ma a magic performance that that basically relates events where where different entities sort of play tricks on him, where for example the coin doesn't vanish when he wants to and only vanishes when it wants to. Then, then it's it's a complete reversal. It's not man who is competent to deal with reality, but man's inefficacy to deal with reality. He he's basically showing a very malevolent view of the universe, uh, who show, who who's basically like enacting uh, different different props, sort of sort of playing with him, and making a fool out of the magician, and the and and in both cases, whether it's the magician. Uh, in, in, um, achieving the, the impossible through the different uh, through the different entities and so on, or vice versa, that that the entities play tricks on the magician, it projects a specific view of man and of reality. If you want, we can go uh, on later. But just to re to relate it to objectivism, um, in that sense, if magic is well, since magic is an art form. Then it has profound value for any 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 human being, uh, since it concretizes a specific view of man and of reality, a specific sense of life. Then it then it has the utmost, I would say, um, value to a human being. And depending on the type of uh, magic performances that he that he that he enjoys, that he contemplates, looks at experiences, and so on. Then, then it then it has the same role as reading um, Atlas Shrugged, or it has the, the same role as looking at uh, at Michelangelo's slaves, or it has the same role as looking as um, as I don't know um, a a a romantic painting, for example. Just as on the other hand, it would uh, it would have the same consequences on a, on a human being if he if he just read Tolstoy or if he just uh, read a uh, Zola or whatever naturalist um, uh, painter or writer or whatever um, type of artist, uh, in effect. So when a magician shows that he is in control, yes, that conveys a positive sense of life, a, a, yes. a, a view of the universe as benevolent in the in the way that yeah. Ayn Rand use it as yeah. conducive to, to man's happiness yeah. and well-being. Yeah. But a, a magician can also show the opposite yes. if he's being made the fool of. When you put on your act, are you conscious of that? Do you intentionally go out and try to demonstrate a benevolent view of the universe? So um, I would say, I would say no for one for one reason. Uh, no, well, not a no in the sense that that I don't do it or that I won't do it. But I'm currently writing a a book to sort of summarize the the very basic fundamental view of magic to sort of start a philosophy of magic, if you will, with an objectivist context. Um, and so cur currently, I I paused the 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 magic performances, creating magic performances, and so on to focus on the book so that then when when it's all laid out and clear in my mind, I can start um, 
uh, creating, but what I really want to create and really want to concretize through through my magic performances. If someone asked me, for example, right now to perform something, um, the I, there would be a sense of the 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 the, the yeah the, the tricks or the performances that I would show would implicitly project a benevolent view of the universe would project a man as achiever of the impossible but it wouldn't but I wouldn't make it an explicit statement uh it would it would just be implicit in the events of uh of the of the magic performance in effect what is your intellectual and emotional experience as you're performing? Ah, uh, so um, the so the way I ident the, the way that I identified first for myself and then as a as a as, as a sort of general uh, rule, I would say that the 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 value that magic has when when you are a magician is to be able to embody the concretized stylos view of man that you that you're that you're sort of putting in the script of your magic performance which means that that for that that for the duration of the performance you you are your your own perfect man in effect or your own perfect woman if you're a a female a female magician sorry um yeah so 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 it it's it's really to be able to embody those those uh those metaphysical value judgments uh that view of reality that sense of life and to, and to be able to to sort of it's to it's to be able to to embody with without the without the sort of the actual context the real context that you have which may be mixed depending on on different people and to different degrees um in 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 performing at least when i perform um, there is this sense that that I am embodying that per that perfect view of man that I sort of wrote out in the uh, in the performance. If that can answer uh, the question. <laughs> and, and what experience do you want the audience to get ah, when you're performing? So, in the same way that I want to embody my 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 sense of life, then it's for then the value that that my spectators would receive is to be able to directly perceive and experience that sense of life directly so either usually when they're whether objectivists or usually rational people i would say in effect uh then then there is this then there is this um this i would say interest in a benevolent universe where man is competent to know it to deal with it and to succeed in it uh which is the view that that is sort of presented in uh in in my magic and many other and in many others, magicians' magic, in effect. Um, the only the only thing I would say though is that is that as a as a spectator, um, it, it the, their experience of the specific um, magic performance, the specific evaluation that they will make of the magic performance, at least on a sort of subconscious sense of life level, um, is really depends. On their sense of life, first of all, on it really depends on what do they consider important in life, and and usually objectivists will enjoy uh, my magic, and it's and it's usually for um, a a rational audience, I would say, that I am performing, um, or that or that that I wish to perform, uh, because I cannot <laughs> always always uh, always have a a hundred percent um objectivist audience or a completely uh, like a hundred percent uh metaphysical realists uh in my audience uh but the more i have the better it is at least for all of us because then i don't need to sort of explain the entire thing like oh well it's not real and so on and so on what does it take and this would kind of be a, an elaboration of, of the last question what does it take to truly, for an audience, to truly appreciate magic? And what I mean by that is not just to sit there and enjoy it and, and like yeah. not just to be like, wow, but to really appreciate it. Like I used to watch the show Dancing with the Stars, for instance, yeah. and I don't really like dancing. I don't, I don't care about dancing. But what I liked about it was the actors and actresses and you know, the celebrities that would go on the show were really coming out of their comfort zone. 
and really having to put forth a, a tremendous amount of effort in order to compete on that show. And I, I had an immense amount of respect for that. Similarly, when I would watch Penn and Teller fool us, the once I understood the amount of effort and skill behind the performances, I came to appreciate it at a different level. So if somebody's at your show or at another show, what what type of psychological characteristics, I guess, does it take to really appreciate magic at the level that you want it to be appreciated? Yeah, yeah. The in two words, I would I will in two words this. I would say that 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 the audience would have to be metaphysical realists. What I mean by that is that they they already understand that I'm not claiming to any uh, supernatural or mystical powers. I do not claim that I can um, make things act um, outside of what they are. Um, that they hold in a context, or they hold as their given context, that miracles do not exist. If they understand that miracles do not exist, if a thing acts in accordance to what it is, uh, then in then given that context, spectators will not try to focus on the how it is done, because they know that 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 it must happen by some by by some specific causal chain of events or actions on my part. So if they if they put aside the how it is done and what 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 the events show um it's the be the best way i could i could describe it is instead of asking um how yes how it is shown how the seemingly impossible uh, effects are shown is more of what do the impossible effects mean and what is the magician trying to project if they if they if they take that as a baseline if they look at magic not as a means to fool them, but simply as a means for me to show them what I value in life, what I what I consider important in life, and to, and and if they and if they concentrate on the specific view and on, on how the specific view is done, then they can I think thoroughly contemplate it, thoroughly enjoy it. And then the fo the focus then is oh well does this have value to me or is this valuable to me um, are uh, are those things important to me in my life and so on because the second you 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 switch the question and you go from the what is shown to the how it is shown then then the then the relationship between the magician and the audience between the spectator and the magician becomes not a, oh let me show you and you will contemplate. It's oh, I will try to fool you, and then you must figure it out, or you're or you're completely fooled, and you're not an imbecile, but almost, which which is implicitly um, the the issue facing spectators and magicians today is emancipating themselves from the from concentrating their focus on the how, and and switching towards the what, and the day magicians. And spectators will understand that it's the what that is more important than the how. Then we will be able to, I say we um, as um, as a, I, don't, I don't want to say like as a collective or anything, <laughs> but um, but that will be the day when ma when magic maybe maybe respected as a proper um, art form. But until then, I I don't I don't think that well it, it will be continued to be seen as some sort of trickery as some means to fool to deceive and it, and it's going to be cynically rejected by 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 anyone who really wants to enjoy it or being able to enjoy it yeah i'm going to go back to wrestling for a minute because of what you just said because people will often say to me how do you watch that stuff when you know it's fake and my answer is always well hold on you watch star trek for instance do you think star trek is real or you know when you when you watch Star Wars or when you watch your favorite TV show Seinfeld, do you think that's real? And the answer, of course, is no. You enjoy the performance, yes. and 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 it's the same thing when I watch wrestling, and it's the same thing if you're. I would imagine if I'm watching Magic, is it's not a mad, matter of being tricked; it's a matter of appreciating the art form and watching it. 
and being like wowed by it. it so it, it, would that be an, an accurate way to, or, or an accurate analogy, I guess, the, the, yeah, the wrestling would, analogy and things to, to what you're talking about. Exactly. exactly. It is the, the thing is that, that the, once again, if, if, if people do not focus on the how, then, then the focus is, is on the what, on the, on the actual content of the performance. It will, let me give you another analogy um, to when, when people, magicians and spectators alike, focus on the how instead of the what, it's exactly the same as if, as if, the, as if a sort of viewer or a consumer of art would look at a painting and instead of focusing on the actual painting, said like, I wonder what um, brush he used. Or, for example, um, another example in literature, instead of focusing on, oh, well, what, what, is, what, is, what is the author projecting in the book? He would say like, oh, I wonder what, uh, what type of pen did he use to write it, right? It's, uh, it's really focusing too much on the means and not on the, well, wait, but, but, he, but he wrote a thousand pages to, to, to talk about his love of man and how great humanity is and, 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 the, and the potential in human beings. Why are you focusing on if he had um, a dollar store pen or a pen that cost four, 400 euros? It, it's, not, it's not really, um, it's not sort of, it shouldn't be the focus. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> That's what I would, I would, well, yeah, I would be saying. I, I saw an interview that you did not too long ago with James Valiant on the Daily yeah. Objective. And you talked about people who use the art form for ill, basically charlatans. And, and you mentioned John Edwards. And I, and I used to see him. He had a show crossing over or something. First of all, what do you think about such people? And secondly, how, what should people look out for? Like how how do you come to understand what's going on? Like if you if this guy appears to be really channeling your dead relatives, how would you debunk that or demonstrate to somebody that that's not the case? Yeah. Without giving away too many the secrets yeah. of your craft, I don't want you to do that. But I just want oh, people to understand how this is fake. Yeah. It's not real what this guy is doing. Yeah. The, so the first thing I would I would say if a person would come up to me and say like oh well, what do you think of John Edwards he's a great magician right and so on I would, uh, I, would, I, would I would say to the contrary he is probably the worst type of magician to uh, to exist on the face of the planet for one simple reason is that instead of focusing on the what is shown he focuses on well he basically uses magic as a as a means to some other end. And the to some other end is dominance over others because th that's all that it is. Every well, 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 I'll take the the one of one of the quotes that I really enjoy from from um, Galt's speech, which is every dictator is a mis uh, is a mystic and every mystic is a potential dictator. I think it, I'm not saying that John Edwards is a dictator. Far from it. What I'm saying is that is that he's using magic. Not as a not not as an end in itself to to just enjoy performing because he loves performing. Au contraire, he prefer he he uses magic as a means to some other end to deceive someone in order to gain power over that person, which is the communication of some of some dead right. relative and, or whatever. And, and he's also appealing to the most vulnerable and the most yes, gullible. Yeah. He's not he's mm -hmm. not trying to deal with it the intellect of other people no, no. to the contrary he's looking for people that are subject to being duped yes to being duped yeah or it or subject to be to, to being duped or uh or because they are in a very vulnerable place because they lost their relatives so 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 emotionally there aren't there aren't gonna be like yes this is how it's done it's no they they want to they 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 are grieving they are expressing the, the 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 subsequent emotions from losing a value, and it's usually a very important value. Um, and and for and for him to say like, oh no, wait, but he's not completely lost. It's really it's re it's really emotional manipulation in in every in every sense of the term, and it's I would say 
disgusting, and I would even call that uh, call that completely immoral to to use um, to use magic as a as a means to to some un, to some other uh, irrational irrational end. And it, it, is, it depends on cold reading, right? That's what it's called. That he cold yeah. reads the people. Yeah. What so what what is cold reading exactly? Like what 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 is how is it done? Yeah. Yeah. So the, from what I know, uh, cold uh, cold reading is um, is the I would say the ability at least, or to or to or to pick on specific body language cues that would that would that would be deduced to to some other to some other specific uh, generalization. For example, uh, if I said like if on my part, for for example, uh, I uh, I was the one being performed to and someone would, would say like I see that you like from the way I'm dressed for for example he would deduce whatever whatever is deducible uh, and then and then he would, he would make a broad statement which which would sort of almost read the person as if like oh well um, uh, oh well you well you dress very 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 I would say yeah correctly properly whatever you want to call it um I think you I think you, there there's a lot of attention to the way you dress, you're a, you're a well, you're a very sort of sort of focused person, right? And it's a very broad statement, right? A focused person doesn't really say a lot about the person because, but but from those little um, cues, then he could, then he can get the bigger, then he thinks at least that he they can get the bigger picture and and sort of have a sort of cold reading, as in I do not know anything prior. To ex to meet to meeting you and simply from the way you are, from what I'm gonna say and how you're gonna react, I'm gonna deduce things or induce things from from what you are from what you are, what what you are and how you and how you act in effect. Cold I met a woman. I met a woman once who primitively, very primitively, uh, attempted to cold read me. I was 19 years old. And I'm 47 now. So it's a long time ago. And I had a fight with my best friend, a physical fight. And because I had had a fight and the friendship appeared to be over, I was crying. Not mm. only that, but I had blood all over me. And this woman comes up to me and she says, I'm a psychic and I can tell you're very upset. <laughs> right? <laughs> now, obviously, that's I mean, it was like I said, it was very primitive. But in essence, that's what they do. Yeah. They 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 look at a person and they they draw fairly uh, you know, what are obvious or obvious to them conclusions based on the person. When you tell somebody they're focused, that also appeals to their vanity, right? I can tell you're a focused person, and then yeah. they also I've seen him and he'll throw, throw you know it's very ambiguous, just like in us uh, astrology when they, you know in in the type of statements they make but then they'll say i'm getting an a you know are you related to somebody with an a or and yes yeah yeah is an <laughs> a, and, and then it, it's just but that's what they do and, and it's very it, it's disgusting in my view but that's i guess what i'm what i want to say is that's not magic in the sense that you think of it right that's like a disgusting display or a misuse of the craft oh, yeah yeah well i would say that that it, that's even a misuse of cold reading in effect because cold reading can can be used within the context of a performance as one of the methods to achieve the 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 actual magic performance um it can it can be used um as like a sort of little decoration as a sort of additional elements to, to sort of uh, convince the audience that 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 it's that it's sort of really impossible or that or to sort of, I would say to 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 concretize the the power of the magician within the context of the performance, but when it's but when it but where it's not proper to use it is to manipulate people and especially people that are that are emotionally vulnerable, who have lost uh, an important value in their lives, and 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 as a sort of horrible person, you're gonna you're gonna sort of walk up to them and say like, I feel you're sad start from there and th and then completely launch into the sort of the the oh oh it's a dead relative why are you, why are you, why are you sad oh do you know what i can actually communicate with the no 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 i <laughs> no 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 so who is your favorite magician or favorite magician team and why 
Okay. Um, my of, of answer, all time, they don't have to exist right now. Of, of all, all time, time, of all time, I would like to say myself. <laughs> Beside yourself, give me some. Beside else. myself, <laughs> um, I would say Perseus Archimedes, who is a Greek magician. Um, he is, um, I would say, the be the best way I could I could describe him is he is the Aristotle of magic. Wow. Okay. So when I say so, I do not say this lightly because uh, because he truly is, I would say, the aerosol of magic in 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 the sense that he that he was the first one to lay out the very basic principles of a romantic type of magic, of of a of a of a type of magic performance that concretizes specific um, metaphysical value judgments and value judgments in general. Uh, and 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 his and is very inspired by Aristotle since he has written multiple times different chapters in his books on theory and and sort of magic tricks on where, where he sort of explains how different um, magic performances that he's created are done. There there is one chapter, for example, in his in his um, in his current book, in his newly uh, released book, I would say. Uh, called Aristotle on magic, where he applies the principle of the poetics to magic, and he says like, well, there, there is like you can, you can, well, obviously Aristotle didn't didn't think of the poetics as applied to magic, but the but the relation that that Perseus uh, achieves is to show that a magic performance can be based on the principles of catharsis, for example of the climax in effect um, of a and to have like an actual plot an actual continuation a logic a logical progression of events and so on and so on to have an, an actual structure to have an actual story to have a, a, like real values concretized in that performance and not just like oh well do you want to see like a, a card trick or oh do you, oh, you want to see a coin trick um he he really focused on the on the scripture magic and put meaning into it and that's his very general message and he and i i know Percy's very personally we have, we have had many di di discussions he's even the one who who asked me to uh, write my book uh and when and when we we shared uh um uh, where where he shared his chapter on Aristotle on magic and my chapter on the basic principles of magic or, or or the basic principles of a magic performance the different attributes and so on if you just change the terminology the the the, the aristotelian and the sort of objectivist ter terminology we say the exact same thing and we didn't even sort of try to to um to we didn't communicate with the other while we were writing the the content and so I'm very happy to 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 know him to con to consider him a friend, uh, and to be able to release uh, that um, that book with him soon, obviously. But I would say he's my favorite mag magician because he was the one to uh, project, um, or at least to to write about and theorize a romantic type of magic performance through an Aristotelian base or foundation. Fascinating. Well, I know it's going to be bright, but what does the future hold for Owen Christensen? Uh, the future holds for Owen Christensen that hopefully <laughs> the, um, the, um, the current book that I'm writing, uh, which is entitled the Ra For the Rational Pursuers of Magic, um, should, should basically outline the, the fundamentals of a philosophy of magic for magicians and spectators. Uh, and will give them the intellectual, philosophical, and rational ammunition to uh, to properly pursue magic um, as it should be and ought to be. Um, and um, and after that, we'll then writing other books uh, relating to the subject because there there are so many implicit elements from the first book that I can't just stop at one book. Uh, and then on the on the performance side, then creating. Um, creating magic performances that project uh, uh, my view of man, my view of reality um, as it should be and ought to be. Have you ever taken an IQ test? 
Uh, no. My guess is you're off the charts. That's why. <laughs> that's why. That's why I asked. Uh, oh, oh, and where can people find you? I know you're on Facebook. Do you have a website or anywhere people? Um, can I don't have a website just yet. Uh, they can. Uh, people can also find me on Instagram at Owen Christensen. Um, very easily, and they can contact me there. On the, um, I'm open to discussion. Let's say that. <laughs> oh, excellent. And I hope you'll come back and have another discussion with me because you, you, you've sure. been a great interview. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you so much for joining us. Do you, do you have anything else? Is there anything you, that I forgot to ask that you would like to say before I close um, it out? Not much besides thank you for inviting me, and I hope that people will enjoy this episode. I, I'm sure they will. All right. For now, this is the Rational Egoist signing out. I'm Michael Leibowitz. Remember, please let me know what you think of the episode. Any critiques, any praises, it helps. Thank you. Till next time. <laughs>